Hello, I'm Dr. Nikki, and today we're going to dip our toes into the world of medical imaging physics. Have you ever wondered what bats, dolphins, and submarines have in common? Put simply, they have evolved to utilize a versatile technique that uses sound rather than light in order to build a picture of their surroundings. This is called echolocation. Echolocation is the most sophisticated sonar system on Earth, and the abbreviation stands for sound navigation and ranging. So some of the most famous echolocators are bats. Did you know that these creatures send out a series of high-pitched clicks 190 times per second that are beyond the range of human hearing? Sound is going to travel as a compression wave through the air, and when the sound wave hits an object, it'll bounce back. This is known as an echo. The speed at which the echo returns to them will help them to navigate the distance to the nearest object. For example, if it comes back very quickly, the object is going to be closer. If it takes longer to return, the object is further away. The intensity or the loudness of the returning sound wave will also give us an indication of the size of an object. So the smaller the object, the quieter the returning wave, the larger the object, the louder. So size, location and proximity, as well as the motion of their prey, can be utilized or interpreted using their echo capabilities, much how we use our sight. It is quite neat then to think that medical ultrasound is going to utilize the same principles as seeing with sound. Therefore, the learning objectives for this Lightboard video center on three main points. Firstly, to understand the basic principles of medical ultrasound to become familiar with the terminology utilized to describe attenuation and echogenicity of tissues, and then finally, to be able to interpret the standard orientation of images. First things first, if we consider the human audible range, this is going to be two to 20,000 Hertz. Ultrasound refers to sound waves that are way beyond this, Medical ultrasound specifically is going to be then between 1 to 20 megahertz. So let's get started then. So unlike x-rays, sound is not electromagnetic. Therefore, it requires an energy source that needs to be transmitted through a machine that is going to be connected to a power socket to provide it with electricity. And we refer to this as the transmitter. In our case, this is going to be either the big ultrasound machines that you find in the clinical setting or the iPhone or tablet when we're using the Butterfly IQ software. From the machine or the software, we're then going to send a current of electricity through a mobile transducer or probe that is attached to the machine. Once energy enters and passes through the probe, we then have a thin layer on the surface of the probe that contains a series of piezoelectric crystals. These crystals are going to vibrate and deform and ultimately will then produce an ultrasound wave, beam or acoustic pulse. So once the voltage or current is transmitted through the probe, those piezoelectric crystals on its surface are going to vibrate and deform, converting the electrical energy into an acoustic pulse or ultrasound beam. This beam, pulse or sound wave, whatever you wanna call it, is going to travel through the air, interact with the molecules in the air, and then any other objects that are going to be in its vicinity. Let's 
and take a closer look then at this acoustic pulse and what a typical sound wave is going to look like. We can see that this wave is going to consist of a series of mechanical variations. So we have areas of compression and then we also have areas of rarefactions, otherwise referred to as zones of high and low pressure. The characteristics of the wave, however, are going to depend on the matter or the objects or the tissue that it's going to interact with. Firstly, the wavelength is going to be a function of distance, represented in metres, between two consecutive identical positions in the pressure wave. So for example, if we had to measure the distance between two compressions or two peaks, a period or a rarefaction is going to be the time taken then for a particle in the medium through which the wave is travelling to make one complete oscillation about its resting position. And this is measured in seconds. Next, we need to then consider the peaks of the waves. And this then represents the amplitude. So amplitude corresponds to the loudness of the echo which also correlates to brightness. So the higher the amplitude, measured in hertz, the brighter the structure. The lower the amplitude, the darker the structure. Other terms that you're going to come across is going to be frequency. So frequency equals the number of cycles or oscillations passing through a given point in time. A knowledge of the frequency range is clinically relevant because of its importance in the resolution and the ability to visualize structures, particularly at different depths. For example, you should be familiar with the fact that we have different types of probes utilized in ultrasound. Our higher frequency probes are going to help us to be able to visualize features or structures that are going to be closer to the surface, and therefore you'd utilize a linear probe. However, if you want to visualize deeper anatomical structures, so those that are further away from the surface, you're going to utilize a probe that has a lower frequency but can travel further. Lastly, we need to consider the velocity or the speed of sound. So when a sound wave travels through its medium, it is certain parameters of that medium or material which determine the speed of sound propagation. These factors are going to be the density and the compressibility of the material. So we can calculate propagation velocity as frequency multiplied by wavelength and this is represented in meters per second. Each tissue type in the human body is going to have a different fixed propagation velocity. So for example, the fixed speed through soft tissue is going to be 1,540 meters per second. In contrast, if we're thinking then about the speed of sound through air, that is going to be a lot slower. So that is then going to be 330 meters per second, while bone, because it is so dense, sound is going to travel or propagate very quickly through this. So the speed of sound is then going to be 3,500 meters per second. When the wave then interacts with the tissues of the body, a couple of things can happen. Firstly, the wave can pass directly through a structure. Secondly, it might be absorbed by that structure. It might become scattered or it can then be reflected back. If we're then considering our pulse then interacting with the material being skin, Parts of that beam are going to reflect back towards the transducer. Keep in mind in this process, the physoelectric crystals are also important on the way back 
because as they receive the incoming beam or wave, they are going to vibrate, deform, convert this back into energy. The energy then gets transmitted to the ultrasound machine or your iPhone or your iPad, and that ultimately will then interpret the incoming information and then create that picture. Ultimately, the transducer is going to spend most of the time just listening. So listening for the echoes that are going to be returned back from those internal tissues of the body. Let's think a little bit more about propagation through tissue. This is going to depend on three things. Firstly, the physical property or density of the tissue. This will dictate how much gets absorbed and how much is converted back into energy. Secondly, that fixed propagation velocity of the specific tissue. And thirdly, the acoustic resistance. So this is how much resistance the beam encounters as it passes through a tissue. So anytime there is a difference in the interface between two tissues, there is going to be a reflection back of the ultrasound beam back to the probe and back to the machine to then record that point in time. So let's draw on some more tissues that we're going to encounter in the body from superficial to deep. For sound to be able to travel through the body, the medium must be acoustically coupled. So one of the biggest problems we encounter with ultrasound is specifically with air and bone, because both will result in a high degree of reflection and high acoustic resistance or impedance. So for example, there is going to be a high impedance mismatch between the air or the outside environment and the skin meaning that 99.9% .9 of that beam is going to be reflected back to the probe. So it's going to appear bright white and nothing is then going to be able to be seen beyond this. This is because we have such a big difference between the attenuation of air and that first layer that is going to be skin. This is why ultrasound gel is so important for us to use because it's going to help us to match those acoustic properties of skin. In turn, it reduces the impedance from 99.9% .9 to only 1.08% of energy then being reflected back to the probe. This means that most of that beam can then penetrate or travel through the skin. The other problem we then face is going to be the interface between our soft tissue or our muscle and bone. At this point in time, 42.8% of that beam being reflected back. And there's nothing that we can do because these are such deep structures. As a result, bone is going to appear as bright white or hyper echoic. And we're not going to see anything beyond this because most of those beams have been reflected back. Now that we've covered some of the basic principles, I want to introduce you to the commonly used ultrasound related terminology pertaining to echogenicity. This refers to a tissue's ability to reflect or transmit the ultrasound waves in the context of the surrounding tissues. As I've mentioned, when there is an interface between structures with different echogenicities, a visible difference in the contrast is going to be seen. So similar to our other structural imaging modalities, we deal with a series of blacks, white, and gray. And when we're looking at ultrasound, we have specific terms that reflect these colors. These are going to be anechoic, hypoechoic, and hyperechoic. An anechoic structure is going to be a structure that appears as black. This means that the ultrasound beam passes completely through the material and has no reflection. Examples of this are going to be fat, blood vessels, fluid, or in the case of pathology, simple cysts. In a structure that is going to be hypoechoic, this means that more of that ultrasound beam is going to penetrate 
the particular tissue in comparison to bone. Therefore, it's going to be darker than the surrounding tissue. Examples of this are going to be muscles with serrations, lymph nodes, and cartilage. And finally, a hyperechoic structure is one that is highly reflective and echo-rich when we compare this to the surrounding structures. Anatomically, we see this in fascia, connective tissue, or in that really thick, tough cortical bone. A pathological example where we might use the terms hypo versus hyperechoic might be when it comes to describing solid masses. Finally, I just want to finish up with how we orientate ultrasound images. For my current medical students, we are currently exploring the cardiovascular system. So I wanted to break down some of the common cardiac views that you will see to help you to orientate yourself when you're looking at an ultrasound image. There are two things that are really important. Firstly, you need to think about and recognize the position and direction of the indicator button, knob or marker on the ultrasound probe. And then secondly, be able to locate the indicator marker on the ultrasound image. You will remember that the heart is shaped like a football or a rugby ball if we think of the way that it's going to sit in the chest. If we consider that left rotation and angulation towards the apex, this means that we can use our standard anatomical planes to then be able to represent or mimic our common cardiac views. The first view that I'd like us to consider is going to be the parasternal long axis view. This is going to help us to think about the sagittal plane or slice straight through the heart. With reference to the patient position image, we can see that the indicator marker is going to be superiorly located and pointing towards the patient's right shoulder. Let's then consider the relative sides when we're looking at the ultrasound image in the sagittal view. So on the image then, the side with the dot will then represent the superior or cephalic side of the heart. In this case, it's going to be located on the right side of the screen or image which means that the left side then represents the inferior side of the image or the heart and is more towards the feet of the patient. We then need to orientate the near field, so the part of the ultrasound image that's going to be closer to the top and the far field. So I want you to think of the probe like a torch. So the near field and the far fields are going to be orientated based on where the light of the torch is shining from and where it's going towards. So in this parasternal long axis view, with the probe positioned on the skin or the chest, our torch is then going to shine from anterior to posterior. So the near field or the top of the image is going to then be anterior and the far field or bottom is then going to be posterior. The next anatomical plane to consider is going to be our axial or transverse plane. And remember, this is the transverse plane through the heart. This is represented then by our parasternal short axis view. So we then rotate the probe from the long axis position, then to the patient's left shoulder, as indicated on the image below. You will also remember on this cross-sectional view, we're looking at the heart bottom up. So the indicator marker is going to be on the patient's left side. And consequently, this is then on the right side of the image as indicated by that indicator dot. This helps us to then orientate our patient's left and right sides and visualize the left ventricle versus the right ventricle. The near field is still going to be anterior, and this is then going to pass to the posterior side of the heart in that far field. Very nicely, we can actually see that bright white hyperechoic pericardium in this image or view. 
Our final anatomical plane to consider is going to be our coronal or frontal plane. This is represented by a four chamber apical view. In this view, the indicator marker is rotated to two or three o'clock in the position of the apex of the heart, so below the left nipple or the breast fold if imaging woman. To then orientate our sides, if the indicator is pointing towards the left scapula, this is then going to be on the right side of our ultrasound image. This represents the patient's left, and then the left side is going to represent the patient's right. Because the apex is in such close contact to that probe, the torch is going to shine from the apex upwards, so fans out towards the base of the heart. Therefore, our near field or the top of the image is going to represent the apex and our ventricles, while the atria and the base of the heart is in the far field. This is why the image looks like it's upside down. I hope that this has broken down the concepts and principles associated with ultrasound in an easy manner. I haven't gone through a great deal of detail pertaining to medical physics because this isn't really necessary at a year two level in the medical program. But I hope by going through the terminology, the interactions with common tissues, the attenuation and the orientation of the scan, that this makes it a little bit more manageable and less scary when you next stumble across an ultrasound image. For more such videos on radiographic appearance on CT and MRI, please subscribe to and follow my Musculoskeletal Anatomy YouTube channel. Thank you and take care.